and every moment counts. The speaker begins to outline the plan, detailing each step meticulously. They emphasize the importance of teamwork and communication, stressing that success depends on everyone's cooperation. The group listens intently, absorbing the information and preparing themselves mentally for the challenge ahead. The speaker's words are clear and concise, leaving no room for misunderstanding. As the minutes pass, the initial tension starts to ease, replaced by a sense of determination and focus. The speaker continues to provide guidance, offering tips and strategies to help the group stay on track. They remind everyone to stay calm and composed, even if things get tough. The clock keeps ticking, but now it serves as a reminder of the progress being made. The room is filled with a quiet but palpable energy, everyone working together towards a common goal. The speaker's voice remains a steady anchor, guiding the group through each phase of the task. By the end of the hour, the atmosphere has shifted from anxious to accomplished, a testament to the power of preparation and collaboration. The room, once filled with tension, now buzzes with a sense of achievement. The speaker, now more relaxed, smiles at the group, acknowledging their hard work and dedication. They take a moment to reflect on the journey, appreciating the effort and commitment shown by everyone. The clock, which once seemed to tick so loudly, now serves as a reminder of the time was. The group, now bonded by their shared experience, Great job, everyone. Let's keep this momentum going. The room erupts in applause, a fitting end to an intense but rewarding hour. We are on air, right? Great. So, friends, hello, everyone. My name is Pavel Filipov, and Fedor Konstantinov is also online with me. Today, we are with you on the same topic, the presentation of our new investment project from Solar Group, the next generation airship. And today we will talk about the fundamentals. We will discuss what this project is, what kind of company is being created and who is creating it. And of course, how each of you can participate in this and earn together with the company. Answer your questions, write your questions on V Contacte, on YouTube, wherever you are currently watching. Somewhere, probably in about 40, 50 minutes, we will address these questions and will definitely answer all of them. Before we begin, I would like to note that we are discussing a new project from Solar Group. It is indeed new because we have been working on the previous project and continue to do so for over seven years, but we have a small milestone here. Exactly one month since the project started, so we can already draw some conclusions, comparisons and parallels. We managed to attract approximately $400,000 in the first month of operation, and we consider this a positive result. 1,500 investors have joined us. And in comparison, for example, with the first project, I looked at the statistics, and to be honest, I can hardly believe it. I need to double check. 
but it seems that we have outpaced the do it now engine project uh, by 10 times in terms of startup pace because in the first month of the first project we had about 130 135 investors join us while here we already have 1500 investors in the first month we have repeatedly said that this is how it will happen because we are starting from completely different initial positions Therefore, we are confident that the next generation airship project will be even bigger, brighter, and more mashtabni than everything we have done before. If you have already joined us, I congratulate you on having the opportunity to participate in the project under the current pre-launch stage conditions, which are still available. I remind you that we are not even at the first stage of financing out of the 20 that will be in total. We are at the pre-launch stage. Accordingly, the investment conditions are currently twice as attractive as they will be at the initial stage. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that if you are already an investor, you are probably considering whether to increase your investment package. So, unlike the doing of engine project, pre-launch packages in the next generation airship project cannot be increased. Therefore, if you have made an investment, taken a package, and you like the project, and you plan to increase the volume of your investments, I recommend that you do it now, specifically increase your investment package right now. If you can't wait, you can do it today by contacting technical support. If you are ready to wait a little bit, the corresponding functionality should be available to us literally in the coming days. You can take advantage of this and turn your package, for example, worth $1,000 into a package worth $5,000 to $10,000, thereby making a more substantial investment under the conditions that are available today. The pre-launch phase will be short. Only the most attentive lucky ones will manage to participate in it. I hope that you will be the lucky one here since you are attending this webinar today. In order for us to grow, I ask you to like and share this broadcast because despite the fact that we have already gained good momentum, we are still in one way or another, at the very beginning. Everything depends on you. How quickly we will fly on our own next generation airships and how soon we will start operating them depends specifically on who is watching this broadcast right now. Like repost, it really helps to increase views. The project is for the people, so everything is in your hands. Personally, I once again realized that airships are not something fantastical. In fact, they are indeed quite practical and understandable, and they are actively used around the world. Just a few days ago, I confirmed this by taking a ride on an airship in Germany. I and several partners from Solar Group experienced the sensations of flying on a next generation airship. If you are interested in learning more about how it was, watch the previous webinar where I share my impressions. I am showing footage from the Zeppelin Museum, showing what the inside of the next generation airship looks like. It is an incredible feeling and very interesting to observe this. I think it will be if you are interested in it. A video will be coming soon. So friends, how quickly we stop traveling there to Germany depends on you. Soon we will be flying on our own. The project is large. The project is interesting. And some ask the question, after preparing for a very long time and thoroughly searching for new projects, why did you choose the next generation airship? And now I would like to address this question at the beginning of our presentation to Fedor Konstantinov, the head of this project. Fedor, please tell us. So once again, I greet everyone. A good question. Why airships after all? Because this is most definitely the coolest of what we found. In our search for projects, we were actively looking for them both before and during the doing of engines and thoroughly. Many inventors came forward, technologies emerged, and there was communication with numerous research institutes. And such a huge, large-scale, ambitious, commercially attractive and incredibly highly eagerly anticipated project like the Next Generation Airship turned out to be the only one. One of the criteria by which Sergei Semenov said that it is necessary to look for a project 
is that this project should ideally be industry forming for a mechanism like crowdfunding a very high profitability and a very large margin are needed. Ideally the goal is to create something that has never existed before to form a vast market then it will be an extremely profitable venture and the mechanism of crowdfunding will be justified and Derijabla has turned out to be just such a project. Firstly the industry, as Pasha said, is actively used in the world. Not extensively, but it is used. There are very few airships, yet there are an incredible number of tasks for them. The industry can really be expanded widely, and whoever lays the foundation for this industry, meaning creating the prerequisites for subsequent mass usage, this company will become very wealthy. And it's not just that this is an enormous industry with many tasks and responsibilities, which we will discuss a bit later. In fact, a lot of people are generally interested in airships as well. In Yandex and Google, there is statistics available. You can go and see how often people in general type the word airship and search for everything related to it. There are many videos on YouTube with questions like where the airships have gone, why there are no modern airships, and what modern airships would be like. In general, everyone is asking what is wrong with these air vessels, they should exist. If people want them to be there, then it means they are attractive to the public. These questions and the curiosity surrounding airships indicate a significant public interest in these unique and fascinating air vessels. The fact that people are still asking about them shows that airships hold a certain charm and allure that continues to captivate the imagination of many. The crowd mechanism is still a mechanism of public financing and so the stars have aligned as the next generation airships have somehow disappeared and we have a chance to restore them. And not only that, we have an opportunity to revive them. This opportunity has been formed. Thanks to the engineers who have already built these next generation airships, have operated them and have successfully commercialized these projects. Indeed, this is a remarkable achievement. All the necessary modern technologies are in place and there is a team of manufacturers ready to take on the organization of serial and mass production. And plus, yes, their absence and the demand from people. Where are they going? Let's build them together. A combination, so to speak, of all these the available opportunities created a chance and therefore, yes, we definitely chose such a large and ambitious project. Indeed, that's why we are not considering others for now. Can you explain in a few words what an airship is? Is it a controlled balloon or is it some kind of airplane that resembles a balloon? Where can they be applied and where can they be effective? I think many people indeed understand what an airship is. It is some kind of large gas-filled structure with a certain useful space. This entire thing can lift a useful load and carry it over long distances. In fact, this is the principle of Archimedes. We inflate the balloon with gas like a little balloon with helium and it tries to float on its own. And it does not expend energy to rise. It is really just the action of Archimedes' principle. As airship enthusiasts say, it is a kind of anti-gravity device. Well, in fact, yes, it is a certain volume that fights against gravity and tries to rise up. And you definitely don't pay for it energetically, like, for example, on a helicopter or a quadcopter or an airplane or a rocket. All these modes of transport, such as airplanes and helicopters, require energy to stay in the air. The next generation airship having zero buoyancy can rise above the city, stabilize and remain stationary without consuming fuel. But yes, the wind blows from side to side and it needs to be fixed, but for this there are modern thin film flexible solar panels and electric motors and this sunlight will be quite enough for it to correct itself staying in place for free. And this is precisely what distinguishes the next generation airship from everything that currently exists and can move through the air. This means that it can stay for a long time, indeed hovering there for a day, two or even a week or even more. 
Regardless of the situation without landing, it can hover over a point or move over long distances. In other words, no airplane or helicopter can afford such capabilities. Well, in addition to that, unlike an airplane, the next generation airship can take off vertically like a helicopter. This is very important. He definitely doesn't need those huge runways there. Unlike a helicopter, it flies farther and is indeed quieter. Nothing oscillates or trembles there. And if we indeed consider the consumer qualities of this flying vehicle, how does it essentially differ from what a dirigible is? It is more like a ship. It's like when you are on some kind of watercraft, you enter calm waters and stand on the surface feeling generally safe. The same goes for the airship. It gently rises to a certain height, remains still in silence, and you don't feel any vibrations, overloads, or accelerations. It's just like being in a hot air balloon with similar sensations, but much safer because it is bulkier, there is more space, and you feel much more protected. The airship. Well, if we talk about applications, where do these abilities, so to speak, have the potential to be applied, in your opinion, not just in your opinion, but where are they currently being applied and where will we apply them? The same thing happened with computers. When the first computers appeared, no one really understood why they were needed. They were only dealt with by so-called geeks programmers for their research purposes. And now it has come to the point where everyone has computers for personal use. They are already in refrigerators, in televisions, and everywhere else. People usually come up with their own applications for the tools that appear in their lives, finding innovative and creative ways to utilize them for various purposes. The airship, for instance, is a unique and versatile tool that can transport cargo from point A to point B directly without the need for transshipments, which is very important for maintaining the integrity and safety of the cargo. This method of transportation is not only efficient, but also cost-effective, with expenses comparable to truck freight. For example, if a cargo needs to be delivered from the manufacturer's factory to the warehouse, it first goes by truck, then by train, then by ship, then again by train, then again by truck, and finally to the warehouse. And that's all. First, the average speeds are low, Second, there are transshipments, time, money, and so on. The airship can pick this up from the manufacturer and bring it directly to the warehouse or to a commercial consumer. Well, it depends, of course, on what it is carrying, and such delivery is something that no one else can provide. Also, like this overused topic about how airships can transport oversized cargo, well, not just oversized in general, but super heavy. We had an airplane that could carry approximately 200 tons, and there are no more like it. For the next generation airship, approximately 200 tons is quite a standard load that it can lift vertically, carry, and also set back down vertically. And so this large heavy object is often depicted in cartoons as if the airship can indeed deliver a wind turbine assembled or bring and set up a lab tower. This is understandable, but in reality, it is not always effective to solve these tasks in this way. For example, for Rosatom, which is currently a leading company on the planet engaged in the uh, construction of energy blocks, they actually have a lot of large components for the reactor that are designed as a whole based on the logistical capabilities of our modern times. And if there were a dirigible on the market right now that could take this large part and transport it directly, for example, from somewhere in Chelyabinsk, like a steel mill, to Africa, where this block is being constructed, then the designers would immediately design the part larger without needing to segment it, which means they wouldn't have to weld it on site in Africa. In other words, when a tool with its own technical and economic characteristics appears, then business starts to adapt to it. This is related to the areas of application. The areas of application depend on how much imagination one has.
There is a lot of talk right now about the connectivity of territories, not only in our vast country, but also in island nations like Indonesia or in Africa, where the population is distributed so evenly in relation to the roads. Spread across the entire territory, there are some infrastructural centers where there is both medicine and, conditionally, an abundance of products and everything else. But just 200 kilometers away, there is no medicine or anything. And delivering supplies, for example, can be very difficult in some cases. One can imagine such a situation. I can't even picture it. Right now in our country, not only do we have a medical train that is supposedly being organized, but we have also seen medical buses. The airship could serve as a flying polyclinic, such as taking off from a regional center and following a specific route to provide various different services to the local communities in need of medical assistance and care there. In remote areas where we currently have a market economy, People actually say such nonsense, like it's indeed unprofitable to build a hospital in some village. This is indeed a fact in such economic circumstances and conditions. But building a flying hospital to serve all these very remote areas is especially a good thing. And there are countless applications for the next generation airship. I will repeat once again. The most interesting projects for us, for our country, are the transportation of oversized cargo, carrying rocket carriers to launch sites, and assisting Rosatom in transporting components of these power units. This involves transporting the same liquefied helium to supply it to countries in Asia from the factories where it will be produced. Its production is currently being ramped up. This logistical challenge is being addressed and there is also the task of rescuing astronauts, which is a very beautiful challenge. These are indeed major, significant tasks, but there are also ordinary, everyday ones. This involves the delivery of crews, along with equipment, for example, to a shift somewhere in the far north, bring some in, unload, pick up others, and take them away. These are generally regions like Yakutia, where the roads are only winter roads and such as the airship fits perfectly there and the region comes to life. This is, well, naturally a tourist story. Ideally, of course, each region should have its own airship with its own, how should I put it, well, perhaps nuances. If this is definitely Altai, then it is all in the Altai style with local food and uniquely decorated. It's clear that the Yakut Moscow and St. Petersburg markets are very enticing for tourism. And naturally, it's not just us. The Arabs are undoubtedly and undeniably very interested in tourist airships. They are almost literally lining up and eagerly buying places for each other to see who will get the first airship. They are actively searching around the world for someone to build it for them. It is very much needed and everyone incredibly wants it. There are many special tasks. For example, the Ministry of Emergency Situations, MCHS, deals with fire extinguishing and detection. These are unmanned truck options. It is important to understand that the next generation airship, in the case of mass production of certain models, can transport cargo at a cost comparable to that of a truck transporting goods overland. If we consider the total volume of cargo transported on the planet, trucks are likely to be in first place, making cargo transportation very interesting from this perspective. There is a video by an American blogger who discusses how much it costs to transport one ton by airplane and how many tons are transported in total, as well as how much money it costs to transport one ton by sea freight, which is naturally cheaper. Therefore, more cargo is transported by sea and overall the market for cargo transportation is larger than that for air freight. Trucks have proven to be the largest in this regard. He mentions that if airships achieve such production volume and cargo capacity, they could easily compete with trucks. 
However, this is his analysis. It is not some commissioned video by an interested party. This person simply asked the question of where airships have gone, and he delved into it, uncovering that the French want to use them for transportation, which is also a very interesting challenge. In general, there are indeed numerous applications for the next generation airship. The main aspect is to demonstrate the very possibility of creating a line of airships, show that they can, that they can be modern, that they are definitely safe. Well, their technical and economic indicators, of course, must be appropriate, and the business will sort itself out. Well, yes, the question arises, where is the money? Where is the money here? Where can one earn? And now that we have just been to Germany and flown on these airships, the question is indeed significantly alleviated because this company, Zeppelin, in the city of Friedrichshafen, where they operate, has an annual profit of 100 to 150 million euros. So the question is, what are they doing to earn such incredible money? Unreal, because they don't have that many airships. There are only a few, plus a few in America, and so on. And even they earn such money. So they have written there that they are the first, well, obviously tourist flights, a clear thing. Such an attraction, but with quite an expensive ticket. By the way, the ticket costs between 400 and 800 euros per person. Seats are available for this price per person. The flight lasts from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And despite the price, each airship makes 12 flights a day. You can book in several cities where they operate, specifically in Friedrichshafen, about a week in advance. However, there is still a queue, and not all flights will be available a week ahead. It is advisable to book at least a month in advance to ensure you get the time and flight you want. The demand is incredible, even at these ticket prices because people are at least interested in the experience of riding in their own airship, and it is truly very beautiful, providing a completely new E experience. You can't fly in a hot air balloon as controllably, and you won't be able to see as much. Well, in an airplane, you'll be going too fast, and the windows are small, so you won't see anything. Here you have open windows, you are flying, enjoying yourself, walking around the cabin, Overall, the experience is completely different. Additionally, they are working on fitting these next generation airships with appropriate technology to monitor the weather, take photographs of the terrain, and possibly create maps or assist certain services. Well, I mean, they perform such tasks. And the first thought that came to my mind immediately was, why not make a long distance bus like that? You boarded the next generation airship in the center of a small city where there is actually a small platform to take off and you flew to the center of Moscow and landed or you even landed at the airport in Domodedovo because these airships, they fly and they were simply given a piece of the airport. That is, regarding the infrastructure, there is no need to build anything. The space and infrastructure are all already in place. You sat down. And essentially you need a piece of land. Well, if we consider it from the perspective of, they also ask about flight permissions, well, you can land at the airport. So that's the first thought that came to my mind. Further, from what I heard, you mentioned that cargo transportation is one of the flagships, something that is indeed very economically beneficial and that we will also be doing. You talked about delivery to medical professionals. About the flying hospital, we just received news that in Kenya, a next generation airship is already being launched and it is unmanned. It delivers medical supplies to hard to reach areas of the country. This is also very interesting. It is already operational. It exists. And the most interesting thing is that it is unmanned. Today, Sergei Semenov also sent news that some French company plans to transport tourists to the Arctic starting in 2028. This is also very interesting a tourist destination. In general, yes, there is room to grow and there is money here. Even in the example of this company, Zeppelin, the only thing we haven't touched on yet is stratospheric airships. Many are also interested in them. So tell us a little about what they are. And if there are any other examples, maybe from other companies in the airship market, it would also be interesting to hear about their successes and challenges. 
They are making them, they are making them. The whole world is making airships. Right now the English are actively producing their airlanders, and Sergei Brin is working on his large rigid airship. Several state-owned Chinese companies are developing a few closed models. So far they have only flown a copy of our uh, AU-30 from Russia, and they have already certified it. I think they will move forward soon. The airlanders in England are aimed at tourism, specifically first-class tourism, and the ticket prices are ridiculously high, which is unclear. Why did they decide this? Apparently they are making it for the elite, but in reality the airship can be completely accessible to everyone. Pavel said that it could even be used for intercity and interregional flights, similar to the limited aviation in the Soviet Union that was available for sale. They are planning to create the same airlanders, but their design is slightly incorrect in terms of dynamics, aerodynamics and aerostatics. It is unstable. However, they have already committed to this idea and it works in our favor that they have taken a misguided path. We have good colleagues in Africa and you just mentioned the news about a very small drone that can carry about 8 kilograms in unmanned mode. The French helped establish that startup and they also have a small startup with a radial airship for monitoring power lines. In general, everything is taking to the skies. Everyone understands that from an economic standpoint, this is very feasible and attractive. From a technical perspective, we can solve problems that were previously unsolvable. And, well, we are also in a good starting position in our country. These airships were already being built in the 90s and in the 2000s. During those years, all these engineering teams were preserved, the developments remained, industry institutes are alive, and the documentation is intact, so we can start very well. Yes, and about the stratospheric one, yes. And it's interesting that you immediately touched on the topic of the team. Tell us about the stratospheric airships. There are also so many news stories about this right now. Some other companies are trying to do the same. And you touched on the team. So tell us right away, to create such a project, a real team is needed. This is how we started to form this project. What kind of team is it? What kind of people will be involved in all of this? I would like to mention the team of active engineers who already have experience with developments, expertise and experience in the construction, operation and certification of these next generation airships. They sold them both to various destinations abroad and operated them within the country to various destinations. In general, everyone from the aviation sector is working in various fields, including in different NTOs and in space. In commercial ventures, everyone talks about airships. They have been involved in this for their entire lives. As soon as they realized that the project could take off, they all gathered together and said, let's go. We'll talk about the team a bit later, but the stratospheric airships present a very interesting challenge. There are several startups that you can easily find and search for on Google from the West that promise to lift a capsule into the stratosphere on a balloon, a kind of stratospheric hotel. It's like a near space journey where you will ascend, see the boundary between the atmosphere and the dark cosmos, spend some time there and enjoy and then descend back. It's a very ambitious project, quite romantic. People immediately pay attention to it. Well, of course, I also want to ascend to the stratosphere there. But all of this is just marketing and PR. In reality, it is undoubtedly and absolutely necessary to indeed finance the creation of such a network of stratospheric devices that will perform functions such as communication, remote sensing, reconnaissance, and more. And how to attract the attention of investors, money, and so on. Well, it's clear through such romance as a stratospheric hotel, but in reality, everyone's tasks are completely different. The idea is to create a stratospheric satellite-like grouping, because from an economic point of view, it is more advantageous than orbital satellites launched using launch vehicles, boosters, and upper stages. 
rockets are extremely costly and take a long time, such as several months to prepare for launch, the satellite has gone into orbit and its maintenance is currently unfortunately technically impossible at this moment in time. But to lift a stratospheric airship that will remain over a single point, perform its functions, adjust and naturally indeed certainly fight against the winds and so on. In the stratosphere, the atmosphere is highly rarefied and the sun indeed delivers a kilowatt per square meter, which is much more than what we have here. In the future, it will operate on clean solar energy and hydrogen fuel cells and it could hang in the air for months or even years. The only thing is that we will have to deal a bit with the degradation from ultraviolet light on the coatings. The equipment located on the next generation airship in the stratosphere can descend, be replaced, repaired, serviced, ascend, and hang there for months performing tasks, communications, and everything that satellites do and can be moved at any time upon command. But a satellite cannot provide that. Creating such a next generation airship and lifting it into the air with such a payload is much cheaper, almost a thousand times less than assembling an entire rocket that would launch even just a few satellites. For now our rockets fall back down instead of landing and this is a very expensive endeavor. And for a long time I will repeat again, and much longer than it takes to make such a series of stratospheric devices. In general, the whole world is moving in that direction too. Everyone talks about it very indirectly, and some keep it a secret because the stratosphere has not been conquered at all. Helicopters fly, airplanes fly, the atmosphere is clear, space is clear, but there is still the stratosphere between the atmosphere and space. And the market for the services that can be provided through the stratosphere is so incredibly vast and that everyone is absolutely keeping it a secret, locking their lips and simply striving to enter it. And the engineering team that has now gathered for our project to implement it believes that we will compete for this market. Everything is in place for that, so we will conquer the stratosphere and become very wealthy and useful, something like that. Indeed, the engineering team, which has now gathered for our project to implement it, firmly believes that we will compete for this market. Everything is in place for that, so we will conquer the stratosphere and become very wealthy and useful, something like that. Well, then, moving on to us, yes. Let's talk about how we will be useful and what will make the company rich and successful in terms of the business of next generation airships. What is planned to be done within the framework of the project? What assets are to be created? Which next generation airships should be prioritized? Let's also talk about the team. We can even start with that. Yes, a bit more in detail about who will be doing all of this. about the project well the team regarding the project it is how the team implements the project yes that's right well you can start with fixed assets we can start in general by explaining what the project is what is being created for the amount we mentioned where we invite the crowd investor what will be built for this money what to expect and what the timelines are. Let's talk about this. First of all, a design bureau is being established. These are all the design engineers who have previously worked on this. They gather under one roof in one area. There is no need to build anything here. These are ordinary rental offices. Obviously, there is office equipment, computers, servers, and accounting and so on. This includes the top team of designers, a conditionally average management team, and the line engineers, designers, calculators, dynamicists, programmers, and so on. A whole bunch of people. This will be a leading design bureau, a primary enterprise that will create the initial technical designs of the next generation airship, technical specifications, and will further oversee, so to speak, their development this will indeed be a development process. Here is the head executor of this Design and Technology Bureau, TOKB, that we are creating. And it will naturally and inevitably attract related industry institutes and organizations. The production of these engine builders and these shell manufacturers. 
in these aircraft, in these structural materials. That is classic work of a classic design bureau. There is no need to build factories, steamships, or design bureaus there. Just lease space under one legal entity, properly registered, and from that moment on, start engaging in active activities related to the industry and the development of next generation airships. The model will specifically be like this. Naturally, the airship needs to ascend into the sky from somewhere and gather somewhere, and for that we need land and two hangars. We still haven't made a decision regarding the land. We have a management fork on what exactly we should do ultimately. Naturally, one wants to own the land to be independent, to avoid any unforeseen circumstances, misunderstandings, and so on. Here, property can be acquired in two options. It can be completely empty agricultural land, or it can already be a ready-made aerograd such as such offers come in, they call and say, hello, good day, we have an aerograd, all from the Soviet times, we have in general acquired it as property. For some time it was commercially successful, but now it is a liability. Please take it away. I am ready to give it for such a price. A good option is to have flat flight fields right away, as well as some buildings and structures. It is already conditionally included in the city's master plan. All the necessary documentation for flights is already in place. Some height above it has already been approved. This is a great option. But it's quite expensive to buy an air city right at the beginning of the project. Purchasing agricultural land, for example, is naturally cheaper. Ideally, it would be around 100 hectares, but it can be less, and it won't be very expensive. However, then the legal and administrative work begins, such as converting the land first into industrial, and then into special aviation land, leveling the fields, laying roads, and bringing in electricity and gas. Even the roads, gas, electricity, and leveling the land are relatively minor details compared to obtaining permission from the local administration for the land to be converted for aviation use into some kind of air city into an experimental airfield where aircraft will operate. When no one has ever engaged in this before and nothing has taken off from that field, getting permission can take a very long time and be very costly. At least three years, which is the least desirable option. The first option is to take your own prepared land or to acquire an existing air city that is genuinely available for purchase. The second option is to enter into a partnership with someone who already has an air city that they are using. Whether they are satisfied or not is another question. They might want to see us as equal partners, for example, when we merge our businesses. We would take them on certain conditions, and we would become co-owners of that air city without paying for the land. We wouldn't buy or lease it. We would simply become partners with them and start implementing the project together on their land, building hangars. This is a pretty good option. We have a sufficiently good, fast, and high-quality partner who has already done all the work with the permitting documentation, experienced, and so on. There are also such options, and for now we are focused on this one. As soon as it is implemented, we will definitely share everything and tell you. This land is indeed needed, as I said, to build two hangars there. Two hangars consist of one hangar for one type of apparatus and the second hangar for a larger size of apparatus. These hangars will be built, yes, and there is a question here. Can a hangar be built faster than according to the KTB with an ovlamage. Yes, it can be built a hangar. Well, it's completely standard construction. The only difference is in some external finishes, but the AP KTB Suvelmash is indeed a one-of-a-kind project, very intricate, 
featuring high-frequency rooms and super-ventilation systems. In general, yes, it can be built much faster. The builders will complete it in a year, and it will oh. be fully ooh, ready for use and operation, provided that all the necessary permits for its construction are obtained and that the land is in the correct condition. Here, in this location, two hangars will be built. The first hangar will be specifically for a small-sized airship. Naturally, we will not start the industry just anyway. Here is Sergey Brin, the founder of Google. He dreams a lot about airships, and he immediately took on a large scale, right from the start, with a rigid scheme. That is, he gathered a team. Some of them had some prior experience with airships, but overall the team is young, I mean the newly assembled team, and ideally, it should progress from small to large. He reached for something bigger, and that's why his budgets are constantly multiplying there, and there haven't been any small incremental victories that would inspire the team. Instead, there are a lot of problems with this big contraption. This is not a path to follow, but indeed airship enthusiasts really have a problem with gigantism because the next generation airship has a slight increase in linear dimensions, but it significantly gains in volume and its flight and technical characteristics improve, allowing it to lift more. That is, its aerodynamics slightly deteriorates due to size because here the area is considered one, while here the volume is cubed. Yes, and the lift is much better. The energy capacity is also significantly greater. If the supporters of the state are like this, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, then why not right away? And so we need to build huge ones immediately. And no one wants to start small because it's conditional economic efficiency when compared to current logistics solutions only begins at a certain scale, at a sufficiently large enough size, definitely. But this is when comparing logistic solutions in terms of transporting cargo or passengers. However, the airship has unique properties, unique variabilities, and unique characteristics for which people will pay. You don't necessarily need to calculate the cost of transporting one ton for one kilometer if your task is to suspend a couple of tons of equipment over the city for up to a week. Well, you are here. For kilometers, we are executing. What if someone is not conscious? Immediate action is required. So, I will start with a small device of his. So, correction mode. Guys, we are back. They say there was some problem with the sound and we got interrupted at the most interesting part. I almost forgot where we left off. But, in general, we agreed that the airship should be built gradually, starting with a small apparatus. And we discussed this with our engineers and designers. They were initially also caught up in gigantism, suggesting to build some huge airships right away with some incredible amounts of money involved. But still, indeed, the first hangar will be built for a small yacht. Its exact dimensions are being clarified, but it is conditionally expected that in the unmanned version, or with one pilot, it will be able to lift about two tons of cargo. To transport it a thousand kilometers or to hover in the air for two or three days or in the passenger version, six people can travel on it in good comfort. And for this little yacht or airboat, you can help come up with a name. The first hangar will be built. And on these airboats, pilots will be trained. Technicians will be prepared. And in general, methodologies will be developed an operational experience will be gained. In short, this little yacht is needed. And the first hangar will be constructed for it, composed of glass and concrete and other materials, conditionally designed to accommodate and service two such next generation airships. However, it is not needed as a parking hangar the hangar serves as an assembly shop and a repair workshop where the airship comes for regular maintenance and inspections, according to the procedures outlined in its operating rules, which will also need to be created. 
The hangar is being built so that theater institutes, which are engaged in the development, production, and ground testing of their components and assemblies, can eventually send them to the hangar. The final assembly of the next generation airship was completed in the hangar. It is taken out of the hangar. It can be outside, stored safely like airplanes and helicopters are stored there. They will definitely be designed that way. Return to the hangar only for necessary and essential maintenance, repairs, replacement of something and so on. And the first hangar, notably indeed, will be built with a functional roof. This is if you have seen videos of how airships were once moored to docking masts or how people would come out with ropes to handle these airships. This is all from the last century. In the first hangar, quite good modern solutions for the launch of this next generation airship without human involvement will already be demonstrated, including how it will take off, land, and perform some kind of tourist flight. Even the initial airships, while they will still be in operation, will already be able to participate in such commercial tourist activities. It will land on the roof. The same hangar demonstrates the possibility of landing on the roof, serving as a special landing platform. Many have seen in real life and in movies how a helicopter landing pad is made on the roof of a building. Conditionally, it is a similar platform for landing the next generation airships. It will be attached like a dragonfly with its legs. And the airships must definitely be able to maneuver so that they face into the wind. In general, the first docking station will be built as a platform where people will not land on the roof but will exit back from it. This will demonstrate that the next generation airship can land on the roof of a building in the city center. It just needs to be equipped with a special platform. Overall, with any new developments, it will be possible to negotiate after this demonstration that a next generation airship can land at your residential complex. If you install such a structure, I think this will be a very enticing offer. Also, the next size of the airship, the second hangar is being built, will be able to land on this roof. Here is the first hangar. Yes, it will be a typical. After all, it will be a bit more complex than Overall, it will feature unique solutions, with some aspects being not quite standard, but still half of it is just ordinary construction. The second hangar, for the next size type, will be fully standardized. It will not have a functional roof because it will also be used for the assembly and parking of two airships. It is designed for a larger size category, with a payload capacity of 10-15 tons, and this same 10-15 ton airship will be able to land on the roof of the first hangar, demonstrating that it is indeed a standard platform and any airship can land there. Well, I even say that it will actually sit down, but it won't. It has almost zero buoyancy. It touches the roof moors and just stays there calmly without putting much pressure on the roof. In general, this is a demonstration of such typical solutions. Two such hangars need to be built, and they will be constructed within the timelines and amounts that you will see a bit further on. We will tell you more about them later. So, what do we have next on the slide? Production, probably. What is being created within the framework of the project? This refers to production, not the construction of a factory, some large enterprise or anything else. All factories and enterprises have already been conditionally created around the world, and in our country there are many of them that need to be utilized. It is not necessary to create everything from scratch, and this is already a faux pas. Everyone works in cooperation, yes, but some critical technologies still need to be kept to ourselves, meaning that if we give away all the secrets like that to the straw men, then indeed. You won't be able to protect your commercial intellectual property, so to speak, because anyone can replicate it. Therefore, critical technologies such as the soldering of these shells or some unique transmissions 
I won't go into specifics just yet, but it's advisable to establish these technological processes somewhere on your own premises. Partially this could be accommodated in the same hangars that are being built. And for certain technological processes, likely some quickly erected structures, like warm hangars, could be placed on the same land. They have more than enough, there's no need to build, as I say, some fundamental factories or steamships. These are just a couple of the various and complex technological processes that we will leave behind. Yes, to maintain a certain uniqueness so that no one can copy us. Next, the slide likely discusses the establishment of a flight school, a school for pilots and technicians, which is essential for operating the airships. Someone must manage them. And to do that, they need to be trained. Additionally, to have those who can teach others, such institutions must also be created. In general, all of this is handled by specialized schools accredited for this activity. Here we already have a partner who indeed recently created such an aviation school from scratch. He already has licenses for thermal airships. Licenses haven't been issued in our country. They were revoked. In general, based on their school, they propose to continue developing it and start training pilots, technicians and other personnel there. And this is incredibly very important because of the sheer number of professions working together in the same exact field, which is a large number of professions working in the same field. I think in some native home, I don't know how many there are, probably more than a hundred or maybe two. And there we see many people. When we enter, those who work with passengers, those with luggage, those with equipment and those with security. Such a complex infrastructure and architecture for airships is not necessary, but nonetheless personnel is needed for their maintenance, service and so on, and all of them need to be trained. And such a school will definitely be created, and all of this will be established within the framework of this project and this funding. It is also indicated that external business projects are being created. They are not actually external. These projects, which are initially perceived as external, are in fact internal initiatives. Once the design bureau starts working, there will be progress on the ground, in the airships, in schools, and so on. This progress will be evident in various sectors, including but not limited to ground operations, airship developments, educational institutions, and other related areas. Many current business players will begin to take an interest as they see that things are serious and moving forward, and it is quite likely that they will want to place some orders. As these business players observe the seriousness and forward momentum of the projects, their interest will be piqued, leading them to consider placing orders. For example, for my business, I need an airship that can transport approximately 12.5 tons over about 900 to 5 kilometers in certain climatic conditions. With a specific frequency, I need a certain number of them. In general, this results in a development for which business enterprises will be willing to pay, and it is specifically about these business projects that it is stated that even if a large investor comes from outside, such as a client or customer, it all falls under one project that is financed through crowdfunding. Since the crowdfunding investor and the crowdfunding method allow everything to be initiated from the zero stage, the crowdfunding investor must benefit from the entry of a large player at the initial stage. Therefore, the entire legal architecture will be structured in such a way that any interaction with external funds, whether from a large investor or a major client, should lead to a benefit for the crowdfunding investor, in essence. This line is about external business projects and other initiatives. Yes, and speaking of finances, which you have already mentioned, and overall about funding goals, you can now see these figures on the screen. In order to implement what Fedor was talking about, a total amount of $100 million in investments is needed, taking into account marketing expenses, partner program costs, promotion, and everything else, which we plan to attract on time. Our current financial plan is set for just over three years. We are aiming for three, it is written three to five years because some types of airships will appear faster, while others may take a little longer. 
right now. I think Fedor will also elaborate on this important and highly relevant point. And by creating the company in such a minimal, efficient and effective version, as Fedor mentioned, this company, based on the most basic, fundamental and classic business calculations, will be worth no less than $1 billion, considering how much money it will generate. And this is what we are indeed talking about regarding the profit. We say that this is the minimum calculation because we are discussing the profit that the company will receive from producing and selling airships. But here is that very last line that Fedor mentioned about external business projects. Even in this minimal implementation, the company will already be able to take on some orders that will generate additional profit even at this stage. Therefore, this is the minimum valuation that we are laying out under the current business model. Now, in order for everything to fall into place for you, I will schematically show what we have just discussed. Fedor, you can interrupt me and add something. The first thing Fedor mentioned is the creation of a design bureau. Essentially, this is the very place where the engineers, who are the brains of the entire enterprise, will be located. It is precisely the team that has already built airships in Russia, which operated them and achieved certain results. Accordingly, within the current timelines and budgets, it is planned to make two devices, one weighing two tons and the other 10 tons. Speaking of two tons, well, by the way, Fedor, I guess uh, what I flew in was something like a two-tonner, right? A little more, yes. This two-ton model of ours is designed for six people. You flew with about 12 or 15. But conditionally, yes, their sizes are roughly the same. So, here are the functions that can be performed. Clearly, there is tourism, as it happens in Germany, where we can attach any equipment to it and then carry out some kind of observation. I don't know observing abroad, checking the weather, photographing the terrain, delivering something small, for example. To some hard-to-reach place, this device will be able to handle this task. Well, or just as a personal yacht for wealthy people. That's also very interesting. And Fedor also mentioned that there are interested people from the United Arab Emirates, if I'm not mistaken, who, for example, find this very interesting and would like to have such an aircraft, it can be pilot operated or it can be an unmanned version, for example, or such as that is such an aircraft. Accordingly, the second one is a 10 ton device. This is indeed already a significantly more serious device. It can definitely either carry heavier cargo or transport a larger number of people. It can be either a flying hotel or a small medical center we talked about today. This is already a workhorse, which, as you, Fedor, mentioned, is a competitor to the MI-8 helicopter, one of the most popular in the world. Essentially, an airship can perform more or less the same tasks, just at a lower cost. If we are talking about some commercial aspect, in terms of various aspects, do you want to lift and carry it further, furthermore, uh-huh, and moreover as well? Yes, this is a what is planned to create two such devices. Next, we talked about Earth and its environment. To undergo the necessary certification tests there, it is absolutely essential to create two devices of small size and also two 10-ton devices. In general, it is preferable to create three, but in our country, it is possible to manage with two airships in order to obtain the necessary certificates and permits for their commercial operation, as well as for their further serial production. Therefore, within the framework of this project, two two-ton devices and two ten-ton devices will be created. They will be certified, and the hangars will be prepared for the mass production of these specific types of devices. Yes, but we have crowdfunding. People here, they like something fun, so I've already seen people writing that we will have to make at least three devices 
because one will definitely need to be burned in a spectacular way for the hype for marketing. Well, we'll see. Yes, that's people. Oh, I see how it is. Well, then on the contrary, let's show that it can't be broken. This is what people are asking for a crash test. Accordingly, the land, which was also discussed now, has various options for how to purchase it, either in partnership with someone or independently. On this land in this area, there will be two large hangars. And further on, we have a school and production for the community at this point in time. The enterprise will also be able to successfully, effectively, and efficiently work with one or two clients. And as I said, working with these clients is essentially additional profit, which we are not even considering in the previous slide when calculating profitability and capitalization. However, this will definitely be the case. So we are counting on a capitalization and profit that is much greater than in the minimum, let's say, pessimistic calculation. This is our perspective for the next three, five years. This is what will be done within the framework of the crowd as part of this project. But that does not mean that we do not understand where this company will move next. Of course, it has a clear roadmap and a clear direction. Overall, this company plans to create additional flying vehicles as well. And now I'm showing them a more detailed and comprehensive scheme with future prospects for 50 years. I will say right away that the further development of the company can indeed go in many various different directions. This can already be done with its own profit or each additional device can be brought to fruition with the help of private investors or through additional crowdfunding but separate subsidiary companies will be created for this purpose in order to achieve the desired results. The investors who are currently investing in the creation of the very first stage of this company will indeed own the parent company. Accordingly, they will earn profits from all these business areas and from all the aircraft that will be created in the future. There will be no need for additional investment for this. Well. The creation of these additional flying vehicles will not dilute the shares of the current investors. It will be done differently. Fedor, tell us a little about these flying machines, where they will be used. In particular, we have already talked about the stratospheric farm today. Tell us a little more in detail. Yes, I'll tell you now. Here's a question. Is the airship you flew in Germany a... 10 ton one. No, it's a two ton vehicle. It doesn't reach two tons. It accommodates 12 people. If we consider one person to weigh around 100 kilograms, rarely, it has a small margin, plus a little extra for personal belongings. Here it is, the entire German device. It is overly heavy in itself, and therefore, with such dimensions, it offers very little benefit. Well, never mind. The question was about other devices. What do we have listed there? Approximately 20 tons, 40 tons, 200 tons, stratosphere. In general, the golden grail of air vehicles is the 200 ton airship. The whole world dreams of creating it, and some start precisely with it because it is the most economically promising and attractive. This airship represents a significant milestone in aviation technology, offering unparalleled economic benefits and a wide range of applications. Its development is a testament to human ingenuity and the relentless pursuit of innovation in the field of air transportation. But, as I said earlier, it is better to take small steps in this direction refining technologies, enhancing the team's competencies, and so on, as it is less risky and more confident. After 10 tons, there are 20 tons, 40 tons, and after 40, it is conditionally possible to start making 200 tons. What will happen to the devices weighing 20 and 40 tons? Most likely, they will not exist. They are produced in series. Unless, of course, some customer comes along and says, please provide me with such ones. I need a few of them. Most likely, they will also be produced there, two of each type, and they will probably be purely tourist airships, the kind you can board like a real hotel, 
allowing you to fly around the globe ah. to attractive tourist destinations, experiencing the beauty and culture of different places. In this context, they can be used for various purposes, while the 200-ton model, for example, will be designed for various commercial loads, freight transport, oversized cargo, and so on, making it a versatile and essential tool for modern logistics and transportation needs. The intermediate ones will most likely be for tourism, but again, everything will depend on the market. If the market says we will make 20 tons, and it says let's do 60, I will take them right away. We need that many. Then the plans will be revised. But the goal itself is to gradually, gradually reach 200 ton airships and, of course, the stratosphere. All these projects can be carried out in parallel. We can start with the two ton device initially, and then, as soon as the team settles in and work begins, which could take up to six months in a timely manner. The 10 ton device will launch immediately, and also, Six months after the work on the 10-ton device has begun, the next one can be launched, and then the following one as well. Additionally, the stratospheric project can be initiated right from the start, meaning there is no need to wait for the implementation of the first project. Developments can start already, but I prioritize in such a way that most of the energy, effort and resources are still focused on the first, smaller airships, while the others are more optional. So, according to the priority, this is how they are arranged. And the hangar number three is being created specifically designed and constructed for the 40-ton and 20-ton airships. And their dimensions will match those of the stratospheric airships. This means that if an airship near the ground can lift 40 tons and transport this payload over very long distances, the higher the airship ascends, the lower its lifting characteristics become. Due to the fact that the atmosphere is gradually depleting in the current scenario, the Archimedes principle is generally weakening, conditionally. Here the pressure is higher, it pushes harder. There the pressure is lower, it pushes weaker. And that's why the 40-tonner and the stratospheric vehicle, the stratospheric vehicle weighs only a few tons, two to three, conditionally. At best, four. With a size of 40 tons, it will be able to maintain itself in the stratosphere. Therefore, hangar number three will initially be created for the stratosphere, but with the possibility of manufacturing 20, 40 ton devices that will be produced there, go about their business, and then this hangar will be used for the stratosphere. Well, the fourth hangar is clearly depicted for the 200 ton model, but in reality, everything might be quite different because the real workhorse will most likely be the 10-ton model. There is a very high probability of this, at least all the analyses of the markets and the needs in logistics operations currently point to this. It is clear that the first hangar will be built, the second is also clear, and then it may turn out that the third, fourth, and fifth will all be created. For the 10-ton model, simply to expand the series, for cost reduction, the more mass produced the product is, the lower its cost price and consequently its selling price, which means the service that will be provided with the help of this device will ultimately be more affordable. Elingo 1 is designed for this flying boat and it is planned to produce 12 devices per year. There could be more than 12 and it won't be necessary. Although, again, research shows that around 100 devices could simply be sold to private individuals as personal flying transport, and it is also a very high-margin business. Recently, we spoke with a very large Russian entrepreneur who dreams of building airships and dedicates all his free time to trying to launch this industry. When he met us, he was surprised that we had already started, that we had gathered the entire team 
and that we already had an understanding. He is currently in a suspended state, considering joining us. He said, guys, the reason I want to build airships is that when a market already exists, like the car market, the machine tool market or the computer market, there is very high competition and your margins are minimal. You try to make a product that appeals to uh, consumers so that it is bought as a whole and you lower its price and so on. But when creating something unique, like an airship, the margin can be of any size. Here he says, I will set any price I want for it and someone will buy it from me because no one else has it. It has unique properties and characteristics and they will be purchased in such quantities and he provided us with his calculations, meaning that even small boats and yachts, around 100 units, can definitely be sold to private individuals for any price, which would already cover the entire project. However, we are currently planning to assemble about 12 units per year in one hangar, and do not plan for more because we are still focusing on this for now and we will see later. Usually, everything happens with the 10-ton model and the hangar is already designed for 24 units per year. In one hangar, it can be assembled and a situation may arise, as I mentioned, that four such hangars may be needed, for example, to produce 100 units per year, so that their cost price decreases to that of the MI-8 helicopter, and then the market will be completely ours, occupied by these devices. They can be sold for much more than the MI-8 because its flight technical and economic indicators will be significantly higher than those of this helicopter. Why are we comparing ourselves to it? Because it is the most mass-produced helicopter on the planet and many logistical tasks have been developed based on its capabilities, that is, based on the capabilities of this helicopter. So many of them have been produced, which means it solves a lot of tasks. The market is generally established, so this device will likely be in demand initially, and therefore several hangars may be created for the consolidation of the batch in general. as I mentioned, so we can return to the slide. Which one to return? No, well, we just indicated some funds for this. Here, it's just to clarify that there will definitely be clients for the development of unique devices. This is client number one and client number two, as well as clients for serial devices. This is when we made these two flying boats and then a queue form for pre-orders, so to speak. But from this moment, in fact, commercialization will actually begin. This is from the moment of receiving the certificate for serial production and operation of these two devices. Immediately, these devices will be used for tourism. The operating company will start earning. The operating company, which is also the parent company, is the one created with the funds from the crowd investor. Here, and it is also the company that will mass produce these devices. If the customers pay for the device, it means there is profit, which means there are dividends. Here, in order to successfully lift into the air, the first such yacht is planned within the next two years to achieve this goal. In three, three and a half years, we should already obtain the certificate, that is conditionally. In approximately 3.5 years, Active commercialization will begin specifically with the production of serial units and their subsequent sale and eventual operation. It is not excluded that the scenario could unfold differently, not in three and a half years, but in two or even one year, when the first client and the second client come, by which time the foundation of our design bureau will already be established and work will be carried out extensively. 
These clients may come, order some devices, and investors will see profits much earlier than the arrival of the first device. Such a scenario is also not ruled out, potentially in the foreseeable future. Well, yes, this slide also indicates the operating company. There are such... Well, the statement that in aviation for every ruble invested you get 10 rubles back is a development. For every ruble invested in production of the aircraft you receive 100 rubles. For every ruble invested in the operation of these devices you receive 1,000 rubles. In other words, the operating company earns the most. And it is naturally implied because who better than us to operate these devices and profit from them but we are also considering of course the direct sale of these devices and the fact that large businesses will buy them and that they will also operate them we will prepare personnel for them and write technical methodologies to provide everything they need Naturally, we need to know all this, and therefore, we will operate ourselves to gain experience for its further transfer. The stratospheric vehicle is planned to take to the air in an airship format around the sixth year of the project. From the moment it takes off, or even earlier, the company should ideally be on the stock exchange, because when the stratospheric manned vehicle with a payload ascends, to the stratosphere and begins to engage in some commercial activities, the value of this company will soar to the stratosphere as well, since no one is doing this right now. This is akin to how a certain space company emerged and created a reusable stage. The same has indeed also happened with the returnable stratospheric platforms. What will happen next with the capitalization? Something very interesting, perhaps. Well said. As soon as the first airship flies into the stratosphere, the capitalization will soar there as well. And as we have already mentioned, I believe that the company's valuation and people's awareness of what we are doing will also soar into the sky, along with the first device taking off into the sky. This will certainly be a very important turn as well. And I also see that you said the first profit could be distributed even before the first one takes off. And so people immediately write that it is not necessary, it is better to reinvest everything, and it is better to implement the project faster. And in fact, I think we will have several similar forks. That is, the company can always either invest in its own development or pay profits to investors. Therefore, maybe it will be 50-50 with part being reinvested and part not. Or, for example, we implement the same internal exchange as a tool for people who want to get out quickly because people are still divided into two types, those who want to receive money quickly now, and that's fine. And some say that I am investing for 10 years and I want the company to be worth tens of billions of dollars. I am ready to wait for that. Therefore, there can be different options here. Friends, now, let's probably move a bit more towards how the project will be financed and what you as investors can gain from it. Before we get to that, I would like to ask for your engagement once again. I just looked at the previous broadcasts. Can you imagine our broadcasts are watched by over 2,000 people, like the one from a couple of weeks ago, but there are only 120 likes, which means about 5% of people show this kind of activity. And I ask you, please like and share this. Remember that how quickly what we have just told you happens depends largely on you, your activity, your engagement, and your participation as well. Do not underestimate the power of social media. Remember that there is also a referral link. Yes, you can use it for yourself, so don't be lazy to take this simple action. By the way, also don't be lazy to write comments because comments also help the broadcast get recommended and so on, etc. You can write a great webinar there if you like. Feel free to write something or ask your question and we will get to them soon, as soon as possible.
This also helps us promote our project, which is very important. Moving on, what do we have regarding financing what is being offered to the investor? A company is being established as part of the current project. This newly formed company will be responsible for the successful implementation of the project. It will do exactly what we have just described. At the first stage, it will be a limited liability company, but it will later be reorganized into a joint stock company. At the first stage, it makes little sense to immediately establish a joint stock company because a joint stock company involves many more bureaucratic procedures. At this current stage, it is much more important for the company to be able to make decisions quickly, to act swiftly, and to adapt rapidly to market conditions and the changing reality we face, because anything could happen in just a few years. For example, in the Duenov Engine project, we have repeatedly shown how we adapt to any circumstances and continue to do what we do, 49% of this company will belong to the investors who join the project today itself and you have the great opportunity to acquire a share of this business and thereby sharing in all the successes that are sure to come 51 percent currently remains with the team that is implementing the project the registration of this company is underway in fact it has already been registered. Currently, these procedures are underway. The procedures for introducing all the necessary individuals into the founding documents. And very soon you will see this company. It will be registered in Russia and you can find it in any registry, meaning everything will be as clear and transparent as possible. What is the form, right? Since it is currently an LLC, of course, we cannot transfer shares to investors. They simply do not exist yet. Therefore, today investors are acquiring shares in the investment company Solar Group. And these shares that you are acquiring at this very moment will be converted into company stocks after the actual share issuance takes place in the near future and will be beneficial for your portfolio. Shares are sold to us in various investment packages, meaning you don't just buy one share, you can purchase, for example, 100,000 shares at once and note that these shares can be paid for in different ways. You can, for example, pay $1,000 up front, which will be your total contribution to the project, or you can spread your investment over several months and pay a small amount each month. In general, crowdfunding suggests that anyone can invest a small amount, such as $1,000 or $2,000, while only having to pay $50-$100 each month because once again you do not pay all at once but take these obligations in installments and when tens of thousands of people pay $50 or $100 a month and our average check by the way is $165 as of today this is how the necessary financial mass accumulates which helps to implement the project month after month. We need to raise $100 million for $100 million. Investors will receive 49% of the company. As of today, it is planned that the company will issue 1 billion shares after the process of going public. Accordingly, 49% of these shares will be transferred to investors. The company Solar Group plans to issue approximately 50 billion shares to all investors. That is, the number of shares is also limited. These 50 billion shares will then be exchanged for 500 million stocks. Each investor will accordingly receive their portion of the stocks. The financing itself is divided into various different and distinct financial stages. At each stage, we will implement specific tasks and gather the necessary amount within that stage. The closer the project gets to the completion of funding, the later stage of that very funding we are indeed experiencing, actually, in fact, and of course, the risks of investments at various stages definitely differ. Therefore, the investment conditions will also differ. Today, we have 20 stages of financing with you. Not even the first. Today, we have the zero stage or we call it the pre-launch stage. This is the stage during which we, together with you, 
are preparing for the full launch of this investment project. The full launch has not yet taken place. Not all the necessary materials are ready, not all the required companies are registered, and not all the contracts are prepared. We are doing this, you could say, indeed with you live actually, so that you can do it, so that you can see how the preparation for such projects is carried out. And of course, at such a stage when not much is clear and there are many questions, this is compensated by the benefits of the investment conditions. For instance, currently it is significantly twice as profitable to invest at the pre-launch stage than it will be at the first stage of financing so the pre-launch stage is really for either those who are ready to take risks or for those who know us well, are aware of our results, know our successes, and accordingly trust us and want to receive the best investment conditions. What is the main downside of the pre-launch stage? It is that it will end quite quickly. It is stated here that we plan to raise $2.5 million during the pre-launch phase, but in fact we have preliminarily reduce this amount to $1 million, of which more than $400,000 have already been raised accordingly. I think that in another month or so, the pre-launch phase will be completed and the first stage of financing will begin. So, if you are on this webinar, if you can hear me, you are lucky in this regard. You are among the first to have the opportunity to invest in this project and become part of this big business. I also remind you that the investment packages you are purchasing today during the pre-launch phase can only be increased until the pre-launch phase itself is active. Accordingly, if you have taken a small package now to check, think, and perhaps increase your investment package in about six months, remember that you will not have such an opportunity. You have very little time left to make such a decision. Soon. The corresponding functionality will appear in your personal account. Also, information and additional resources for partners that are available. If you are working with us as part of the partnership program, you can already register new people without any restrictions. They can definitely invest in the next generation airship project. You absolutely receive a referral reward without any restrictions. Here we have kept our promise. We have told you many times that in our future projects, your partnership structure will be maintained. And that is indeed the case. However, if you want to receive referral rewards from those investors of yours who were registered under the Sobolomash project, uh. you need to implement a small, comprehensive and efficient marketing plan. Please carefully pay attention to this. Now I will briefly talk about the conditions, but you can generally find them in your personal account. There is more detailed information there. You simply need to make a repost on the landing page dedicated to the project. You will find a button that you need to use to make the repost. You need to purchase a package with a nominal value starting from $2,000. You need to make a payment of $500 for this investment package and then fulfill one of the following three conditions of your choice in total, approximately, in order to complete the process. You must have three first-line investors with a $500 investment or 10 first-line investors with a $50 investment or a $10,000 personal investment. A $10,000 personal investment is difficult here. Choose what suits you best. Remember that until you do this, you will not receive any partner rewards from your old investors. Moreover, you don't even know how much referral reward you have already missed out on. That is, you may have already lost much more simply by not following the marketing plan. At the same time, if you are registering people now, you will, of course, receive referral rewards from them. Regarding the starting positions, I actually started with this today, indeed. When the Duyunov engine project was launched, we had a group on VContact with approximately 6,000 people. They watched the preparation of the project for a long time, basically, as it was here. In the first month, we managed to attract 135 investors. This was a decent result, starting completely from scratch. Within the framework of this project, we have already welcomed 1,500 investors in the first month. That is, 
This project can be said to have started 10 times more actively than the previous one. Therefore, we are absolutely and completely confident that the deadlines we have indicated of three to five years and the amount of $100 million are not just some super ambitious goal, but a firmly and undoubtedly achievable one. Undoubtedly achievable. For us, this is simply a clear, calculable task that we know how to handle. And I am confident that we will meet the deadlines. Well, the start of the project has already shown that you are indeed very interested in this project. It is interesting both in terms of the opportunity to support innovative technologies and from the perspective that for many, airships are truly a dream, especially for those who are somehow connected to aviation. Well, I think many of you have already understood the earning potential of such a business. Fedor talked a lot today about the various business directions, but personally, I can say this. There, when I flew on the airship in the city of Friedrichshafen, there are only a few airships. They are essentially engaged in the most primitive types of business for airships. This includes tourism and various activities such as photography, capturing landscapes, weather monitoring, and everything else. But even this small business brings its founders between approximately 100 and 150 million euros a year. This is a very large amount of money given the expenses that need to be invested in such a business. And I think, in my opinion, to put it mildly, that it is quite relatively easy to start a similar business given the necessary funding and resources and team. We have a team, we know what to do. Now we are confident and understand that our financing will be in order. So friends, join our project and start doing everything together with us so that we can take off in our own airship as soon as possible and enjoy the journey with us and make unforgettable memories. And I assure you that this will be not only definitely profitable for you in terms of investments, but also very interesting in terms of observing what we are doing. I suggest we move on to the questions, Fedor, or perhaps you can add something. I can read the questions, yes, and you can answer them. Well, just go ahead and read what you have. Yes, friends. I will say again that on Thursdays we have answers to technical questions and news, while on Tuesdays, like today, we provide basic information about the project for newcomers who are seeing this for the first time, and this is the first introduction. So if you have technical questions, those are for Friday, specifically not for Thursday, but basic questions about the project can and should be asked today. So feel free to write. We will dedicate some time now to answer your questions. Well, if we take the basic questions, you answered about the birth, right? How can I restore the installment plan? I have a person asking. It doesn't allow you to write to support. Well, Victor, look, you can either write to support. If you can't write to support and there's an email, check in your personal account. Or if you can't find the email, write in any chat and ask for the support email. Other investors will send it to you and accordingly, you will be able to contact support and they will advise you on how to resolve your question regarding the installment plan. So you are selling the packages in installments over 30 months. Sulumash, how much longer will you be collecting the money? I don't know, by the way, why there is a question about Sulumash, but I can immediately answer that with the start of the final stage, which will be launched in just a couple of months there will no longer be long payment plans. Yes, we will have maximum payment plans for 10 months. Fedor, are you suggesting not to answer technical questions? Well, go ahead, ask away. Well, for example, such interesting questions that are also often asked. After unloading, how is the lift force of the airship compensated for? What mechanisms or methods are used to balance the lift force once the airship has been unloaded? There are several webinars, specifically Friday technical ones, where Dmitry Kemel and even Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin talked about methods and techniques for working with this phenomenon in great detail.
including ballast, non-ballast, neutral buoyancy, negative buoyancy, and the creation of a load purely on the propellers, then accelerating and transitioning to aerodynamics. The first small-sized airships will be non-ballasted, and these tasks will be addressed using different methods. Well, these questions, if they have been unloaded, what to do then? These questions, if they have been unloaded, what to do then? Airships of large dimensions, typically from approximately 40 tons and above, will have ballast. If something large and heavy has been unloaded, it's better to load something else on, and this is not scary at all. For example, there are regular cargo flights from Moscow and St. Petersburg. There is always something that needs to be transported in both directions. You unload and reload. This airship, when in the air with cargo, means it is working and generating revenue. If it is flying somewhere without cargo or not flying at all, then why do you need it? It should always be loaded. But it's definitely better to watch those first webinars or come on Friday and ask this question again for a more detailed answer. There will be many airships. The airships will be different. And the methods for addressing this issue will, in any case, be combined with a specific method chosen for each particular operation. It's not the case that we have one solution for all the arising problems. Nothing of the sort. There will be special operations where we will carefully select specific floating airships, pump a certain amount of gas into them, and possibly take some ballast with us, exactly and carefully. Each task is unique, and for each specific task, the personnel who will be responsible for Carefully solving it will take actions based on the technical capabilities of the device. In general, all the methods are well established and widely recognized. They will all be implemented in combined variants. And this is absolutely not a problem. It was solved a hundred years ago. And with modern methods, we can solve it in a very efficient manner and in a beautiful way. The question is about air roads for airships. How will they be controlled? Uh, dispatchers, formations like airplanes or not like airplanes? We flew the airship in the airport area where there are dispatchers, flight attendants and pilots according to airplane rules. It feels like flying on a plane. Fedor, do you have more information on how freely one can fly in them? Well, what flew in our Russia in modern times flew in a helicopter manner. It's simply when the pilot communicates via radio with the nearest control tower saying that he is departing on a certain aircraft to a specific settlement and the dispatcher tells him, OK, your altitude is such and such, fly approximately along this route, but in a helicopter manner. How it will be implemented when airships are produced on a mass scale is something we will get to later. It's clear that having one, two, three, or ten devices is one thing, but when there are hundreds or even thousands, it's a completely different matter. Naturally, there will be their own norms, laws, and other regulations. And many there have the idea that nothing will be allowed in the country or something else somehow, somewhere. In general, it's all somehow complicated. The air corridors are occupied. There are many countries on the planet Earth. There are enough loyal countries and regions that are loyal. There are many various countries that need to solve problems using airships. They will be ready to make any reciprocal moves in terms of permits, legislation, establishing initial practices, and so on. And as soon as someone does this, it will undoubtedly definitely spread all over the globe, as is customary in the aviation industry. And I think in the modern world, this will undoubtedly be absolutely no problem. Everything will self-organize quickly, 
experience will emerge, all the regulatory framework will come into place. For now, we will proceed with helicopters. We will see from there. Friends, I asked you to share the post and many responded. I could see that our audience quickly grew. This is to the point that, as you can see, your activity is very important and largely determines how everything will develop. Regarding the issue mentioned about not being able to repost to their page, it seems there is some restriction. We do not have such a restriction. So please check on your end and then friends try to repost again. As you can see, it really helps. So here's a question. Will the states be somehow protected in any way from drones, air defense, guns, or not? That's the question in the near future from potential threats. Yes, they will be if I answer briefly. But if I elaborate a little bit more, then... Now, modern security systems will be interconnected for private residences, vehicles, businesses, properties, and skyscrapers such as various and other buildings. In the next five years, everything will necessarily be equipped with anti-drone systems because the world has already crossed that line where drones have become the main executors of all sorts of mischief. And against these misdeeds, a protective infrastructure will naturally be formed somewhere. And of course, any aircraft will definitely be equipped with it and not just the airship. So yes, the airships will definitely be equipped with an advanced safety system. But not only them, in general, we will soon see such a flourishing of anti-drone technologies in the near future and various others. But Alexei is asking, since he is in the village, they have an airport there, but I understand it is abandoned. Right. You know, right. And he believes that airships can be revived? Yes. Various similar reports, because small aviation used to be well developed, yes, now it is not as good. And here is the question. Previously, the AN-2 used to land there. Can airships replace it, and how much more expensive are they compared to such an aircraft? Yes, it can be replaced, and all these airfields can come to life, and new ones can be built, and on water, Landing on lake with an airship is generally the most ideal, of course, better than on a field. And right from it, you can dock to the shore on some small watercraft that will come directly from the airships. As for its cost, it's the IN-2. Well, I don't think there's much point in comparing here. It depends on the size. Is it possible to make an airship at the cost of an AN-2? Probably it is. Will he perform the same tasks? Probably not. It will be a bit more expensive. But again, what is the size of the series? In general, yes. The task is to start producing airships of such quality, such series and such economy, that it would be possible to revive all small aviation, but already in the form of airships. Well, that is, based on the principle of Archimedes, on aerostatics, on unloading. In other words, not in an airplane manner, but still in an airship manner. The task is set, and I definitely believe we will solve it. So yes, these air cities and airfields will undoubtedly come to life. Approximately 10 tons is not the entire mass with the useful load. So that's how the question is phrased. In general, well, apparently, 10 tons. 10 tons is the payload that it can carry with it. The device weighs well. It weighs something. A 10-tonner, a 2-tonner, a prokatonic. This is exactly about the payload. So it can be produced in different variations, lifting from 10 to 15 tons, right? Well, yes, if it's for passengers or tourism, that's 10 tons of passengers, their luggage, and some small cargo. If this gondola with seats and other amenities is not needed for passengers, then a certain weight is freed up, which means that in a purely cargo version, more can be lifted. 
So we just dealt with the questions from vcontact and now we are moving on to YouTube. There are quite a few here as well. VK users are saying that it's time to do something for PR rather than just talking about how things will be, blah, blah, blah. Show us something concrete. We will show something specific this month. Preparations are actively underway in September. The launch of small stratospheric devices, as well as small airships weighing up to 40 kilograms, is being discussed. They can carry about 40 kilograms, but that would be a strain. 10 kilograms is easy, and 20 kilograms is normal. There is another airship. In general, the airship pilots and engineers we are working with have been assembling devices as part of their hobbies and personal initiatives. All these devices were not built as toys, but rather as small incremental steps towards commercial operation. Now all these devices will be assembled in one place and we will start demonstrating and showcasing them. Perhaps the same stratospheric probes will find commercial applications, as there is already experience in how to make a stratospheric probe hover. For example, over a city and fly within a certain radius, providing some kind of service, such as communication or monitoring. In general, this is for PR, as you say, and you can also expect the staffing schedules, office, and other details this month. After all, we have only just completed the pre-launch month. As we said, as planned eventually, we will rent an office and put everyone there. Everything will be fine. It will end soon. Just wait a little longer. They are asking here, has the office been rented yet? Where is the video tour? The office was initially planned to be located in the Krilatskoye Business Center, renting the entire 10th floor. Then we looked at the dynamics of financing, reviewed this office once more, estimated, and realized that the approximately 1,000 square meters as a separate floor is not suitable for us at the moment. Well, the cost was 3 million rubles per month, plus we needed to pay a deposit for three months, which totals nine plus three, making it 12. This is not to mention the furniture and so on, considering that we need to accommodate about 45 designers before the new year, we won't even occupy half of the space. Again, the designers who are infected with gigantism immediately want a large office. At first we went along with it and chose him, Yesterday we went to take a look, but we are constantly checking what is available on the market. It seems we have found 500 square meters that fit our needs in terms of price, location, quality and equipment. We're going there again tomorrow morning, if everything goes well. I'll shoot a video tour of the future office for you. Where to sign and where to post it will be in the Telegram channel before the launch. By the way, we also have a group on Vcontact. If there's something cool, we can film it. Maybe a live broadcast there too. I think it will be interesting as well. When I did a live broadcast after the flight on the airship, it seemed like people were watching and liking it. So it works as a tool. So that's it. Yes, it seems that indeed, definitely, all the questions on Vcontact are now completely finished. By the way, about this, about blah blah blah, and showing something. We went to a conference on techno textiles, got to know who is there, and filmed a bit of content. Next week, we are going to a scientific and production association that specializes in the production of various gas tight composite shells, which are quite durable. There are simple gas tight shell bags, for example, which are inserted inside a rigid frame with an overall shell on top. Then there is a soft shell that holds the gas and maintains pressure, plus it is durable enough to hang loads on it without tearing. They are engaged in the production of such shells, and next week they will show us the manufacturing process, which we will also film, but this will all be part of one large video. 
we also need to visit the Baumann Institute, where there is a department. They are currently conducting scientific research and development in the field of gas permeability at present. They are waiting for us too. We will go to them this week. It will be a big scientific documentary film about the current state of the materials needed for our project in our country, who is doing what, and we are being introduced to everyone. They are showing us everything, and we will tell you all about it. Things are being done. Just wait a little bit. I would also add that as soon as a person writes, there will be activity there. Once it becomes clear what will happen, there will no longer be a pre-launch stage. So you see, there is always a balance here. Indeed, there are still many questions, but this will be compensated by the stage. So for some, it's the opposite. It's better for everything to remain unknown for a longer time, so there is more time. Well, let's move on to YouTube. I'm asking about the comparison with a bus in terms of operating costs. Are there any specific figures by any chance? With a certain size of the airship and the serial production of them, they become comparable in terms of economics and overall efficiency to trucks as a mode of transportation in various scenarios. I don't know exactly how close trucks and buses are to each other on the road. But overall, everything really depends on us, the people who are responsible for making decisions and taking actions. Again, part of it may be subsidized by the government if the people say that they want to fly on airships like they do on buses. Well, what can they do? We need to calculate. I really don't know exactly how it will be with the buses. Let's discuss with the economists from the airship project and I will prepare an answer for the next webinar. What is the name of that video where there is an economic comparison of airships with other modes of transport so that people can watch it on YouTube if they're interested? It has all the numbers. I duplicated this video. Last Tuesday, I think. I can repost it in our Telegram today, so if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe to the Telegram group where there are over 200,000 people. And in the pre-launch, I will post this video again right now. This question is somewhat, I would say, philosophical. Who or what could prevent this project from being realized? What are the risks? I would respond like this. There are risks in any endeavor. Even going down the stairs is a risk. Who is insured against slipping or breaking a leg? But when the risks are carefully calculated in great detail, when you fully comprehend what problems you might encounter in advance, they become not risks but simply tasks that need to be anticipated so that even if this happens, you already have a solution. Risks can most likely be called anything that you do not anticipate, some black swans. Well, since we do not know about them, it is indeed consequently quite difficult to prepare for them. One must simply be flexible and ready for changes because when I remember the first project we started within Solar Group, we talked about the risks. For example, what if we don't raise the funds? What if people don't support us? What if we lack the strength? Or what if the government doesn't support us? Now we have come such a long way and we have such extensive experience that I, for example, do not see these risks at all. I do not believe that anyone can somehow prevent us from implementing this project, perhaps having some power or money. I do not believe that we will be unable to finance this project on time or that people will not support it. And I am probably familiar with almost all the designers who are implementing the project. And I am completely confident in them because they have already done it. Let's start with that. Therefore, after thoroughly analyzing all the potential factors and considering every possible scenario, I personally believe that there are absolutely no significant risks or obstacles that could potentially prevent or hinder the successful execution and completion of the project. Airships and World Elites
The person writes that the world elites did not destroy airships for someone to revive them again. What if they won't allow it again? The elites are afraid that flights will be accessible and that people will be able to reach various destinations. How can you, Fedia, comment on the fact that the elites won't be interested? I think airships will make things a little bit more fascinating and exciting for us to build and discover what exactly they are hiding from us. All those conspiracy theories are based on that conspiracy theory. We will see. I don't believe anyone. Asks. Why? From where? I don't know. And uncover the hidden truths behind it all. It's hard to comment. Let's say, if we are really pursued by reptilians or Freemasons and they somehow obstruct our project, we should gather and reflect on what we are doing wrong in this life, since we are being controlled. But I can say on the contrary. As history shows, it is largely thanks to people that airships returned each time. We have already talked about this, that Zeppelin, who built these airships on which we flew, specifically did not build these, but let's say mm, he was a leader in his time. In order to revive his own airship company, he raised $40 million from ordinary people who supported his company and wanted to see airships come back because after the crash of one of the first test airships, he was on the verge of bankruptcy, meaning he no longer had the funds to build airships again. People helped him with this. The same was true in the Soviet Union. People raised money for the construction of one of the airships, the airship Pravda, Komsomolskaya Pravda, because it was organized by the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda. The Museum of Cosmonautics in Kaluga has this information. You can read it yourself and study this material more closely. Well, accordingly, we are doing something similar right now. So, in my opinion, it's the opposite. Yes, it is indeed precisely thanks to people that airships still exist. As for projects related to airships in the past, airships and kraut are somehow very closely connected. People still very much want to fly. Or maybe it prohibits. Well, as for the idea that someone will prohibit it, I remember when Suvalmash was just starting out, many said that the oil lobby wouldn't allow it, that they would prohibit it. But, as you can see, when technology is truly needed and a large number of people are interested in its emergence, all possible external forces that would like to hinder it may simply not withstand this pressure, even if they are against it. So, there are questions about the roadmap. Well, basically, we have today provided a detailed account of everything regarding how the project will be implemented. I also remind you that we are currently working on the landing page and the website, and all detailed information will be there. Additionally, we have a presentation from the roadmap prepared. We didn't show it today, but this presentation exists, and we posted it in the news. I will also send this presentation we have in the pre-launch chat after the webinars where all the stages of implementation are detailed. Why is there a large gap between the $10,000 package and the $25,000 package? It would be better with $15,000 and $20,000 packages in between. Look, we created these packages based on the statistics from the previous project, identifying which ones are most popular and in demand. At the pre-launch stage, no new packages will be available. So if you want to participate in the pre-launch, choose from what is currently offered. Please note that there are very long payment plans. Yes, the amount is significant, but you can take a package for $25,000, I think, for 40 or 50 months, which means the payment is very small. We will see at the next stages. I do not rule out that there will be some changes. Regarding the package increase button, it will literally be available in a few days. The IT team is currently finishing the functionality. In general, this button will be implemented, and this was also discussed today. When there were fluctuations during the Duino project, they promised next time to finance in rubles for Russians, avoiding double conversion. Yes, we are currently considering it. There is such an idea. 
you see it can go both positively and negatively because as you understand unfortunately our prices are tied to the dollar exchange rate if we unfortunately ignore the dollar exchange rate we may simply not have enough of the total amount we state 100 million dollars but we will collect it in rubles and the exchange rate of the dollar will change so we collect only 50 million dollars there is also such a risk here which is why the exchange rate really changes and we are indeed insured against possible economic turbulence due to the dollar system but unfortunately we will accept this and think about if it is worth it and if we can do it this way now what difficulties might arise for financing from europe if you have a legal address in russia i can say this that i can say this that there are difficulties when we talk about certain financial operations they exist in the world today and it is pointless to hide this however we have learned to work with it so our investors from europe and any other countries can easily invest in our projects and there are no difficulties for them they choose the method that suits them best if we talk about some marketing component we have thought about it but statistics show the opposite we already have quite a few investors from various european countries including but not limited to germany france and italy so there are no significant difficulties there are difficulties for example with these americans other than using cryptocurrency it's impossible to get money from them and so there was such a comment from their side my buddy posted it on his channel where he has a lot of american subscribers he also deals with science and covers everything in english he talked about the airship and they told him if you set up a company in america announce the same thing you're saying with those amounts and timelines we'll finance it for you in a week as long as you can accept payments in america your entire project what we really love about airships americans are probably the biggest fans of airships they built and operated them longer than anyone else and now modern ones are not very interested so pasha there is something to think about regarding how to expand the financial system yes one can think about it the interesting thought is that since there are people who understand something about this we are currently trying to work with china as you know and we can also reconsider america taking into account the local legislation as it is indeed very strict there and perhaps it may be upsetting for some to hear this but there is indeed a lot of money in america we often hear about this we often hear that the amounts we mention for america are actually in fact ridiculously laughable sums recently i was also at an investment meeting and there a person said that he had an acquaintance who raised 50 million dollars in america having absolutely nothing just a business plan in fact actually so yes if we succeed in this i think we should be able to make it work in this direction it will be a good support in the development of this business why was the airship's button removed from the solar group personal account we did not remove any button the button is still in the same place the only thing is that we have slightly changed the architecture so to speak now when you click the investment button you immediately see two projects so nothing was removed on the contrary they made it clearer where to click if this is not the case please write will the production be in the form of a separate company is there any point in developing it in a special economic zone if you concede in cooperation will production be somehow protected after all there will be some critical technologies it makes sense to place part of the company in a special economic zone for the benefits that the zone provides such as tax incentives reduced regulations and access to better infrastructure these benefits can lead to increased efficiency and cost savings for the company it is unknown if there will be production there or if it is just possible to obtain a legal address we'll see again a special economic zone is indeed a very useful thing for low margin businesses simply to have more profit and also pay less in taxes and when you roughly speaking shape the market and set the value states yourself 
having a special economic zone on one hand is good, but on the other hand, it may not be so great, because you are still on the territory of a large player. You become managed. On your own land, without any zones, well, it's clear that you are still in some state, but in general, there are both pros and cons to this situation. Certainly, some companies will be in a special economic zone to receive all these benefits. But whether everything will be there is unknown, and whether production will be separate is unlikely. Most likely, everything will be done under a single company, a special division in the parent company. It will be production, there will be a safe for internal accounting, but overall it will function as a single legal entity, if that's the case. There are several questions regarding the calculations, particularly that in the office one share is one dollars, but if we calculate based on the mathematics of exchanging shares for stocks, it should not be one dollars. Please do not confuse this with shares. There are no shares in the office, only stakes. The price of up to one dollars per stake is the nominal selling price, not what the stake will be worth in the future. These are different things and so that you don't get confused we will soon have a feature where you can buy shares for one dollar i won't dwell on this for long right now when it becomes available i will provide more details but generally speaking in the long run it's not about how much the shares will cost in the future this is different accordingly you can directly calculate those figures yourself 50 billion shares you can see how many shares you will purchase within your investment package and how many stocks you will receive. When exchanging these 50 billion shares for 500 million stocks. In other words, everything here is as clear and transparent as possible, in my opinion. So here is a person writing that we shouldn't engage in any reinvestments regarding what we discussed earlier. That is, those funds, 50%, should be paid out as dividends to investors. Well, uh... as an option, yes, I consider it based on the opinion. People write differently. I think that part of it, of course, can be paid out as dividends. And immediately a question regarding the dividends. People say, Solmash hasn't paid dividends yet and you're already launching a new project. Friends, first of all, Solmash has already reached what you could call its logical conclusion. We already hope that this autumn the ZOS will be successfully completed, all documents will be obtained, and the enterprise will be put into operation. Soon we will see the beginning of commercial activities, meaning that Solar Group started working on a new project only after bringing the first project to a logical conclusion so it cannot be said that we left something unfinished. Solar Mash is currently not threatened at all. We have a large number of installments and enough money for Suval Mash to successfully complete the financing. At the same time, you must understand that if all startups in the world were launched one after another, we would still be in the Stone Age. Technologies whose time has indeed definitely come should be implemented as opportunities arise. If such an opportunity exists, and if the project is ready for commercialization, they need to pursue it. And we started doing this at the most opportune moment, when the financing was in order, when we were ready for it ourselves, and when all the basic issues had been resolved. So, 100%, we definitely started this project at the right time. Moreover, you must understand that if we start in a year, when Solmash pays its first dividends, we have talked a lot today about how competitors in the world of airship construction are gradually closing in on us. And today there is indeed a window of opportunity for us. Today we can not only enter this race, so to speak, but also win it. And in a year, in two, you know, many would already be ahead. Therefore, a spoon is good at lunch, as they say. Even within our country, several centers are now emerging that wished to engage in airship construction. And we were extremely fortunate that we started assembling a team of highly skilled engineers, scientists and manufacturers three years ago. 
And in these three years, we have done a colossal amount of work, met everyone and brought everyone around us together. And it turns out almost every single day that these intricate structures were meticulously planning to actively get involved and then started searching for suitable implementers. These structures want this personally. The governor is thinking about what I want to have there in particular. The airship construction industry is about to be launched in its field, and I will start gathering engineers now. If we could just hold on for another six months to a year without hiring them all, they would simply be taken away, because this topic has truly become urgent, not only in all countries, but even in our own country. This team is currently in high demand, primarily because the government has issued an order to prepare proposals for the development of the airship industry, with airships capable of carrying between 30 to 200 tons. And if the government issued an order to prepare a proposal, it means they have allocated money for it somewhere. And since they have prepared the money, it means they found an interested party for that money. They are definitely looking for people, just to take them under their control. And that would be it. We wouldn't have such a huge and cool people's project. Indeed. Someone would profit from this collective and everything would end as usual, in the end, as it always does. I think that we will simply show with the results that we definitely started on time, and that will indeed be the main measure. Let's move on. By the way, I also noticed that usually during a webinar, the number of viewers decreases, but for us, instead, it keeps increasing. Well, I think maybe we should perhaps introduce them a bit later after all. Dear viewers, please write in the comments if 5 o'clock is convenient for you, because I see that the number of viewers is increasing on all platforms by 7 o'clock. Perhaps it really is worth doing this a bit later. So, regarding the office, they have already responded. The question is about the land. Whether it can be done with the partners. Will the business partners, who we have been collaborating with for a long time, somehow start trying to take something valuable from us after we build the berths, which are essential docking stations for their ships? For them, will they make us sign some kind of detailed rental agreement for the use of these berths? Naturally, we cannot, of course, indeed guarantee the correct behavior of cockroaches in other people's heads. And so the ideal option, as I mentioned, is still having your own land where no one will tell you anything. However, there arises a certain question, whether to pay a lot for your already formalized land, to spend a lot of time and effort on your unformalized land, or to engage in such honest partnership. In general, there will be many airships of the Dromov type. The question is simply where we will start. We need to begin with smaller forces, with lower risks and costs on the land that we choose. The subsequent hangars can be built on different land, either on your own or, conversely, first on your own and then with a partner. In general, it should be done where it is quick, safe and inexpensive. Later, we will build on a grand scale because they will be everywhere, in every region and in different countries. In general, we just need to first choose the most optimal option and then I think we will have more partners who can somehow exert pressure on us. Moreover, we have ourselves, you, a whole team of dedicated investors that you can't take lightly. If someone starts to make inappropriate moves, they will keep in mind that there are tens of thousands of people who will be dissatisfied with what they are doing. And I think this is a great protection for the project in any way. Yes, this is also indeed one of the advantages of public financing when many people represent a certain strength, so to speak. And so the same person writes about infrastructure, stating that it is a very good idea to start with small aviation because in Russia we have a large number of various abandoned airports and sites that were previously in operation. And now they can be used in one way or another for airships. And he says that everyone will come to us on their own. So we won't have any problems with that. Regarding the question of helium, which will be filled by the states, 
how harmful is it to the environment in terms of its impact on the environment? In general, it is not harmful. More Helium is an inert gas. It does not mix with anything in a chemical reaction and does not react. If it is released into the atmosphere, it flies off into space, so it seeps out of the earth anyway. Generally speaking, a geosafe gas. He is not someone who penetrates situations. Everything is perfectly fine and absolutely okay with him. Yes, and the question, I think, is the last question regarding the solar group. How does the efficiency, lift force, economy, and profitability of airships change with an increase in their volume and size? The larger the airship, the better. There is definitely some dependence on a square or a cube. In general, definitely check out this video that I have now duplicated in Telegram and enjoy. There, with an increase in the linear size of the airship, conditionally by two times, its economic efficiency grows by about eight times, something like that. I didn't memorize these numbers. But in general, because of this, airship enthusiasts are increasingly suffering from megalomania. They start to gradually increase the size because its efficiency and economy increase significantly. There is a strong dependence. The larger the airship, the cheaper and more efficient it becomes. But building it takes longer and is more complicated and so on. So let's start small and then move on to the big ones with a bit more details about the topic. So this is, in essence, a professional question. Thin film panels. I can't believe in flexible solar panels. How will they be sprayed, glued, or what can be done with them? What does it mean to not believe? Flexible solar panels already exist on the market. They can be bought, seen, and bent. And there are even mats to the point that they are being sold. Roll it up and put it in your pocket. Turn the phone away from him, you're charging it. It's a fairly common technology and there are ready-made factories that offer a finished product. You just buy it and cover your airship with it. This is something that can be done right now. Applying a solar panel directly onto the material of the airship is a slightly different technological process that needs to be mastered. But it is possible to do so. In any case, a flexible solar panel is already deposited onto some substrate. If this substrate is the fabric from which the airship is made, then the fabric itself becomes a solar panel and the airship essentially turns into a solar station. Of course, it will become much heavier and it may be that if the entire surface is coated, it won't be able to lift anything other than itself. And the energy installations, meaning the engines and other equipment, including the autopilot. However, it will generate a huge amount of electricity, effectively becoming a flying power station. So, most likely not the entire area will be covered or coated, but only the necessary parts to provide energy for the electric motors that will be responsible for stabilization during flight, for hovering, counteracting the wind, and supplying electricity to onboard systems, internal, life support, and other functions. That is not necessarily the entire surface. Well, yes, flexible panels are already available. You can buy them. It is possible to spray this as well, but the technological process needs to be mastered. This is one of those critical processes that will initially be done in laboratory volumes. Once the laboratory process is mastered, we will move on to industrial production. What exactly wind parameters can airships operate in? Smooth takeoff and landing at 15 meters per second. Wind smoothly. The near ground operation is approximately 30 or 35 meters per second. It can easily and comfortably stand on the docking mast, although not all hangars can typically withstand such wind as the roof can be torn off. In general, 15 meters per second freedom of takeoff and landing. Anything less doesn't matter everything that is in the air.
In fact, the speed of the small airship is 120 km h, while the large one is 180 km h. Here he can dig strongly against the powerful wind at 180 km per hour, which is blowing from this hurricane. Well, the question that can probably be answered with a simple yes, but it's quite interesting. Could airships potentially replace cargo transportation along the Silk Road between the seas of Sakhalin and the Kurils in the future? Yes, they might. And this is exactly what we plan to engage in as well. And the video that I just shared in the Telegram channel seems to talk about this, stating that the company capable of providing cargo transportation and creating an air-based Silk Road with airships will be the richest company on the planet. It also provides justification for this. Watch the video. Why haven't airships been used for 50 years? Although the question can be answered, I used it because I was flying on an airship for a specific reason, which was quite an experience, and it was a unique opportunity. They did not use oils, nor were they used in logistics or transportation operations. Because, how can I explain this? Just like electric transport first emerged, there were electric cars, then they disappeared, and only now, after a hundred years, they have appeared again as a novelty. Just like airships once disappeared, they will now start to reappear. Everything has its time. History throws some things to the side and picks some things back up. That's how it happened with airships. So, why exactly doesn't Zeppelin currently produce and sell airships in the market? This is about the modern company Zeppelin, but I can respond to that. I returned from there. I rode on those airships and they told us all about it. I can tell you that they are actively developing. In addition to periodically selling airships to other companies, they are also using them for tourism purposes. Right now, they are assembling another airship. Therefore, they are producing. For a couple of years now, they have been carefully and meticulously assembling one airship selling it for an incredible price, ranging from 20 to 40 million dollars, depending on the configuration. This is very expensive, and much higher than its actual production cost. In general, they can live off selling one unit for several years, to feel financially uh. secure. But as soon as our airships start being produced in series, they will no longer be able to afford to sell one unit at such a high price. No one will buy it. Because ours will be newer, more efficient, more economical, more modern, and much cheaper. It is not desirable, so to speak, to fatten this market with these expensive units. For them to truly make a significant impact worldwide, they need to be sold as accessibly as possible. Well, by the way, you already touched on this. It was the next question. How much does a small airship cost? Let's take a two-ton model that we are planning to make. The cost of production can be stated in various ways. Yes. This two-ton vehicle is said to be produced in cooperation with the NAMI Institute and its division Aorus. Most of the work is concentrated on them, both as performers and as industry specialists, and regarding the cabin and the engine. In general, this flying yacht will cost approximately as much as several Auruses. In the last webinar, I asked people who want to know the price to write in the Telegram chat how much they think one flying yacht will cost in senatorial orises. Someone wrote 40 and no, that's very expensive. In reality, it will cost about five conditional orises. Let me calculate. Well, okay, approximately eight, but in general it's either eight cars or a flying airship of no worse quality than this very car that we are considering. This is roughly the cost it will have. Quite affordable, really. Well, it's clear that it's very expensive. Well, 
damn, yes, but the people who can afford it will allow themselves to do so. From them, we can charge a price two, three, or four times higher than what it costs to produce in order to, firstly, pay dividends to investors, and secondly, to further develop the company and build large airships. In general, we have a very large margin for profit and cost, including operational and production expenses, because it will be maximally adequate and highly efficient in all respects. And so many people write the same thing. Every webinar they mention the far eastern hectare, where you can obtain this land. How suitable is this at all? And then a person adds that it turns out they will be building storage facilities for helium there. Yes, anything is possible. I said that these airship terminals will be built in different regions. There will definitely be a task and it will indeed be necessary, which means it will need to be built there. Is it necessary to use this specific government program in order to obtain the required Far Eastern hectares. I don't know, maybe, why not? Uh, there, it is somehow possible to unite. I mean, we united with you, 10 people, and already took 10 hectares. For example, we gathered some team, took 10 hectares, attracted state builders, set up a boathouse there, and somehow operated efficiently. Why not? So, I have two questions. The first question is, is there a design school for airships or will there be one, perhaps? There is a design school specifically for designers who have been involved in this and continue to be involved. But there is currently no school as a department that teaches the principles of designing, operating and producing states. However, it will appear in the near future and we currently need it. And the question is, a person writes that they live in Estonia and are creating a project for an atmospheric satellite. And this project of his is close to an airship. And he asks in general, how can one even get in touch or communicate about this topic? So, in general, can we answer that those people who are somehow involved in something similar want to collaborate with us? How can they possibly get in touch with you? Well... You can write a message in the general telegram chat, right in the pre-start. That is, I am engaged in such and such, please contact me. I naturally read all these chats, watch them, and definitely get in touch. Uh, you can either write to the project's technical support, for example, through your personal account, or also through the chat, saying that I am engaged in such and such, please connect me with Fyodor, Pavel, or Sergei. In general, I need to negotiate with someone. Just write to no. us. Anywhere, and we will be found. Yes. And the last thing I would like to say regarding the questions, oh, the questions keep coming in. I won't check all the platforms again right now, otherwise we'll be answering them for another hour. At the same time, I want to say a big thank you because the activity is just very high. I don't know how many questions we've answered today. And they don't end there. Of course, we can't answer everything in one webinar. Join the upcoming webinars and we will definitely answer your question, even if we missed it today. I also want to read that Fyodor people are thanking you. It is clear that you are already tired, but you continue to answer all the questions. I can add from my side that Fyodor currently has an unreal schedule. And perhaps I wouldn't even be lying if I said that Fyodor is definitely the most or one of the most loaded people in this project right now. But everything is done to ensure that the project successfully takes its first steps, ensuring its success. So Fyodor, thank you very much, especially for finding the time for these broadcasts. It all definitely matters a lot. Sorry, yes, I'm tired. Today I didn't even get to sleep. I don't know how long, but maybe three and a half hours, if that not because of the project. I just had a relative return from a long business trip. Everyone knows what events are currently happening in our country. Yes, we did sleep a bit, but we worked a lot, actually. Today, by the way, we went to Sobol Mash together with the airship pilots. 
when they came to the army, they looked at the engines on the motor lock and said it was very interesting to learn more about it. Today, Sergei Semenov and I went to Sovomash, taking Vadim Zubkevich and Boris Sivchenko with us. They were getting acquainted with the enterprise and they were talking to Dmitry Sanik about whether they could produce 500 kilowatt electric motors with certain specific characteristics and speeds. In general, they were sitting and communicating. Yes, there is a lot of work. I won't keep you any longer, as I am tired. By the way, this is very interesting news, what I just said, that our two projects do not exist parallel to each other at all. If there are points where we can collaborate, that will happen. And I do not rule out that the new generation of airships will be a kind of customer for aviation electric motors for airships. I think this will also be interesting to all those investors who are participating in the first project. It's great that Dmitry Alexandrovich is also supportive of the new project. If an engine is developed, Solomash is probably one of the best companies that can really make it happen. Yes, Dmitry Alexandrovich reflected a bit today on how energy can be generated on airships. I also had some thoughts about this. There is an effect called triboelectricity from friction, and since airships have a large surface area that interacts with the air, static electricity accumulates there, and there are special systems in place. Those that are certified are necessary to discharge this charge so that static does not accumulate. But in experimental directions, there can be anything in various forms and ways. There is in fact a theory and a practical possibility of its realization and execution. Actually, the fact that the airship will generate electricity just by moving, how should it be stored properly and efficiently in a way that ensures optimal use? In general, Dmitry Alexandrovich generated several ideas today, and we are also considering them, so yes, the projects are moving synergistically. And let's finish here with a little joke from the comments. Yes, it was mentioned today that some forces will try to hinder us. One person writes that we will outplay all the reptilians and Soros who might want to sabotage our project, so everything will be just fine. So, well, that's it. Fyodor, when is our next webinar? Maybe the topic is already known. On Friday, I will actually technically introduce you to some new person we haven't met yet. Right now there are currently three potential candidates. Today or tomorrow, I will finally make a decision and we will make an announcement for now. Either it will be Vadim Zubkovich, who he just traveled to our enterprise with today, and he is very excited about the opportunity. It will either be Arkady, a very talented and young specialist from Bauman, who is also deeply involved in the fascinating field of aeronautics and will be collaborating closely with us. This young generation is indeed the hope of all airship builders, truly. Either it will be another person whom I cannot name yet, who is absolutely a very cool guy. And because he is extremely very cool, he works at multiple enterprises with a highly confidential level of secrecy. There is not only state involvement, but also commercial. And we are currently thinking about how to introduce it into the media space because he is very eager to participate with us in the project. He has a bunch of ideas for implementation. So maybe soon we will in fact show you another very amazing superhero. It turns out our country is indeed rich in various such characters. Yes, once again, we are indeed absolutely convinced that there are truly many talented people. And when someone finds the strength and courage to unite them, everything works out. So let's wrap it up. Shall we? And friends, I remind you once again that the pre-launch phase we are currently in will not be as long as it seems to you. You see, everything is moving quite quickly. By September, we will have an office, and some initial designers have been hired. Yes, I think we will make it by that time. Well, it will go on, it will go on. The project will already be implemented from a technical standpoint, and before you know it, there will be the third, fourth, and fifth stages. So while there is a pre-launch phase, 
If the topic interests you, and it definitely does, based on the questions you've asked, and we have already been on air for almost three hours today, don't miss your opportunities, and remember that the current package can only be increased during the pre-launch phase. That's all for now. Thank you all very much. Come to the next broadcast once again. Please like, share, and send this link. There will be a recording available. If you send it to a friend now, they can watch everything in the recording and everything will be fine. Always remember that the overall pace of funding really ultimately depends on you. That's all. Thank you, everyone, indeed. Goodbye.